Obviously, here at the University of St. Mary of the Lake, we have a number of students in all different kinds of programs, uh, but we're going to focus here on the formation of seminarians. I would contend the formation of a lot of the other students in the lay ministry programs isn't all that different. I mean, some obvious differences, but a lot of the same qualities are there. So this idea of the formation almost of Jesus, and it doesn't happen, you know, in and amongst a large group of people or even fellow pupils. It's Jesus out there in the desert. But what put him out there, what got him ready, if you like, is his baptism. And it's not just his baptism as an event. You know, yeah, okay, baptism gets you going. We all kind of get that. But famously, it's the message that he receives, right? So the voice comes from heaven, and what does it say again? What does that voice say? You are my beloved son. What else? Do I am well pleased. Now just think about that for a minute, you know. Jesus is like us in all things but sin, so that means he grew in his self-awareness and self-knowledge. You know, he didn't pop out of the womb necessarily just feeling like he had some script in front of him that he was going to follow day by day. But this idea of the formation of Jesus is it begins with a message, and a really very beautiful message from his father. And it's not just, you know, hey kid, don't drop the ball, or Lots riding on your shoulders. It's just this beautiful affirmation. Jesus hasn't done anything yet, at least that we've been told about. Right? No miracles, no healing. He's just himself. And what he hears from the Father is this beautiful message of affirmation. You're my beloved son. I'm very pleased in you. We can imagine what that means to hear that from your father or your mother or whomever you view, you know, brought you up as a caregiver. And let's be brutally honest, not everybody was privileged to hear that. But we also know, you know, the pain and the hurt that can follow if that message isn't delivered. What I'm getting at, though, is that the formation of Jesus, you know, who, of course, is the high priest, it begins with this extraordinary affirmation. And it's not just a kind of, you know, aw shucks, off the cuff, throwaway line. It's really very profound. Um, and then out of that, he goes right into that deep moment of self-contemplation, certainly sacrifice. He's in the desert. He's fasting. He's tempted. Okay, all of that. But it starts with that beautiful relationship from the Father. And in my mind, anyways, right there in that couple of verses from the Gospel of Mark, you've got in a nutshell what seminary formation should look like. Okay? Now, I realize there's a lot more involved. Uh, these guys would probably love it if they just heard two verses and slapped the collar on. But <laughs> it takes a while, right? There's a lot of learning. There's a lot of growing, all of that. But it really is represented in some primal way in that encounter of Jesus with the Father, followed up by what he learns in the desert, what he suffers in the desert, right? And by suffer, I mean undergo how his obedience to the Father is shaped and formed in the desert and what he receives. And of course, once he gets out of the desert, you know, he never has that quite same scene again. He returns to the desert for different reasons, but now we're off to the races and now all of the public ministry begins to unfold. So traditionally, when a man is ordained a priest, there are what's known as three munera or three duties, right, that the priest exercises. And you've got those on your sheet there. And basically, they are to teach, to govern, and to sanctify. Um, did I get them in the right order? Hey, who's your rector anyways, pal? Um, that was a typo. Uh, I'll talk to my secretary about it later. She's fired. OK, whatever order they come in, they're all important. But that's kind of what you'd expect in a way. OK, to teach, and that doesn't necessarily mean that the priest is going to be teaching in a classroom. But every time, hopefully, there's that interaction with the priest. I mean, there's, there's teaching in homilies. There's teaching with the RCIA group, with you know, kids in the school. Hopefully, any meaningful interaction, conversation, is a form of teaching. Okay? To sanctify, obviously, right? and the sacraments. Uh, we all share a common priesthood by our baptism, but the ordained priesthood has that unique uh, responsibility to it. So to sanctify in a particular way, um, to consecrate, right, to exercise 
uh, the various sacraments. Now this is a really tough one. So uh, if you get this right, um, that million dollar prize we've been holding back will be awarded to you. Does anyone know, uh, well this one isn't so hard, what document from the Second Vatican Council uh, talks about the church? You know, there's a document about liturgy, there's a document about revelation. Our seminarians, now's your chance to shine. Lumen Gentium, okay, very good, Marco. Um, so a lot of documents there, beautiful document, Lumen Gentium. The reason I'm mentioning this is in that document, they lay out the primary responsibility of the laity, okay? Literally, I mean, this is almost verbatim quote. In their lives, in their work, in raising their families, in all their struggles, the mission, the primary mission of the laity is, now here's the million dollar prize. Does anyone know? A sharing in the salvific mission of the church. Can we up the ante? That's in there. The primary role of the laity is to consecrate the world to God. And that's, that is a direct quote. To consecrate the world to God. Okay? Now, unlike my students, you guys are, aren't all surfing the internet right now, so I won't ask you to pull it up and check me on it. But that's literally there. To consecrate the world to God to make holy, to make sacred, right? Now, it's not a consecration like over the bread and wine, but it's not to make holy with an asterisk or a footnote, you know, well, not really. No, that's it. And how often do you think, you know, all the folks in the pews have that realization? I remember the first time I read it, long before I was a priest. That's an extraordinary responsibility, okay? So, Bear that in mind. If that is the responsibility of every man and woman, then this idea of, you know, even in addition to that, to sanctify for the priest, but to just recognize that is part of uh, an extraordinary mission that all of the church is meant to hold, and then to govern, okay? Now, obviously, what does that mean? That's a very broad term. There are canonical responsibilities with that, governance for a parish, um, in a seminary, there's different things that are stipulated in that way, uh, in, uh, in the marriage tribunal. But it hardly means that the priest is the CEO uh, or that the bishop is the boss of the diocese, something like that. You know, so what does holy, collaborative, respectful governance look like? You know, at the end of the day, every parent knows this, uh, you know, whatever your role is in your occupations. Um, not everybody can make a decision, but they're, if it's going to be holy and good, and I don't want to be naive, I realize this can be twisted and abused, but if it's done right, there's collaboration, there's consultation. Um, but at the end of the day, a decision is made, and that's not always you know, a unanimous decision, but everybody should feel heard, everybody should feel listened to. Okay, those are three actions, if you like, to teach, to govern, to sanctify. I get it. But if you think about it, the very fact that you're using verbs in that way puts you very much in the mindset of, okay, what is it that I do? You know, what is it that I have to do? Um, and I remember sitting in these chairs, ha, seminarians, when I sat in this room, we did not have chairs that like recline and uh, there was a finely crushed glass that was on every seat <laughs> made of brick. But it was this room, uh, trust me, not a whole lot of Mundelein Seminary has changed in 100 years, uh, at least in terms of the buildings. So when we were in here, you know, and I think every guy coming in, it's only natural. I think if you go to medical school, if you go to law school, whatever it is, you have that sense of, well, what do I have to do? I want to do it right. I don't want to screw it up. In other words, we focus on the verbs. We focus on the mission. You know, I want to say the right thing. I want the right actions. Um, I hope I, I don't disappoint, okay? And that's very natural. It's human nature in a sense. The seduction there is that it becomes, you know, focused on myself. Um, am I doing this right? Have I mastered my craft? You know, have I paid attention? Um, and of course, we want to do all of those things. I mean, there's nothing inherently bad with that. But the temptation is we do just focus on, you know, so that uh, formation and priesthood is like athletic training or it's like, you know, and there are certainly a lot of parallels, but this is more than that. So 
what I want to also do then is just talk about a couple other ways you might view that more traditional way of to teach, to govern, to sanctify. There's nothing inherently wrong with any of those three, and they definitely are a part of what we're about to talk about. Um, now, I've stolen this, and some of you will recognize it from various sources, but good priest that I am, I never acknowledge my sources, so <laughs> we'll pretend that's all mine. But we start with relationship, identity, and mission, okay? And you've got that on your sheet. Mission is what we tend to jump to, and maybe this is more, you know, given uh, to guys and girls, but I think it's probably pretty universal in its own way. What do I do? You know, I, I want to make sure I govern right. I want to make sure I, I get everything straight with the sanctification, um, the teaching. I want to be well prepared. Well, in that little triad, mission comes last, okay? What is it that I do grows out of something more primary, more fundamental. Before Jesus ever goes off and does a miracle or gives a sermon on the mount or in the plain, you know, before he ever does any of those things, what happens? He hears from the Father, you are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased, okay? You are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. Then he goes out. Because he's going to have some tough times, right? We all know that. I mean, one of the first things he does in the Gospel of Mark, you know, does an exorcism, expels a demon. Well, the crowd isn't always happy that he did it. And obviously, they're so unhappy that his life ends with execution. Well, what was it that allowed him to listen to that? You know, again, he's like us in all things but sin. So that means he definitely had the capacity to feel hurt, maybe to feel disappointed. There's nothing sinful in those feelings. Maybe to feel a little bit tired or wondering, you know, are they ever going to listen to me? Famous scene in the Gospels, right, shortly before uh, the crucifixion. Remember, he's looking out over Jerusalem and he weeps. He says, I want you to receive my love and my teaching. There's nothing I want more than that, but you refuse. And he weeps, he cries. Okay, so before he does any of that, he's grounded in relationship. And I would argue, feel free to disagree with me, but I would argue that that relationship, that foundation is what allows him to weather a lot of those difficult times. And I think we know this in our own human relationships, right? You know that if there is someone who loves you deeply, whom you respect and love, that can be a source of confidence. That can be a space of safety when you're in a rather hostile environment. So when we talk about formation of priests, the mission is important. When a man leaves, uh, Dan, was there something? Oh, okay. Um, you know, the, I don't make a move without Dan Corrential. I just want you to know that. So <laughs> when he indicates I should pay attention, I try. So the idea of the mission comes out of relationship for us, right, with our spiritual father, you know, with the Lord. But there's something in between, that relationship and the mission, and that's identity. Okay, so as I was talking at Mass, a lot of times our identity is shaped by our family. But it's also shaped by a lot of other voices. It's shaped by our employer. It's shaped by our coach. It's shaped by, you know, the people we grew up with. It's shaped by the families we marry into. Uh, for priests, it's shaped by the bishop, by the presbyterate that you're a member of. Shaped by advertisers. Think of all the voices that come at us our self-image, all those different influences that shape how we see ourselves. Your mission will flow almost always out of your identity. You know, what it is that you do flows out of how you see yourself, who you see yourself to be. Your business card might say one thing, but if deep inside you have a very different image of yourself, you know, your business card might say boss, but if inside you feel very weak, very afraid, you know, very vulnerable. How you exercise that is really going to be driven by that identity that you have. If you're going to be a good husband or wife, that's going to come out of a proper identity of what it means, you know, to be a holy and happy and healthy and respectful spouse, um, and on and on. Well, identity primarily comes from relationships. And we can have harmful relationships 
right, that create a sort of perverted identity, identity that's twisted from what it's meant to be. Hopefully we have loving, healthy relationships that really do allow us to grow into that vocation that we have, right? Think of uh, uh, Jeremiah, Prophet Jeremiah. Remember what God says to Jeremiah in the beginning? I knew you from when? From before formed you in your mother's womb, if you remember that line. What a powerful, thanks Marco, what a powerful statement of relationship. You know, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. So for the parents who are here, I mean, you knew your child from the moment of their conception. And that extraordinary relationship, if that is properly lived out and embraced, then that just helps the identity, that shapes the identity of the child as we grow up. Now God has known us, you know, from the moment we were knit in our mother's womb. So if we can grow authentically in that relationship, every loving parent, I don't care the most loving parent you'll ever find, still has a certain imperfection in that love. You know, every human being is not able to fully love unconditionally, no matter how closely you approach it. You know, every person is always going to have some fragility, some frailty. We all carry some baggage with us. The first time your heart was broken, that puts a little condition on your heart. I don't want that to happen again, you know. What can I do to protect myself a little bit? All those kinds of things. But God brings no baggage, right? God purely offers love. We don't purely receive it because our own hearts are conditioned. So again, at Mass, when I said our families often teach us how to give and how to receive love, you know, that's a very powerful truth, I think. And so consequently, the more authentic our relationship with God becomes, the better we see ourselves as God sees us. Um, I sometimes say in spiritual direction to direct ease, the primary goal of the spiritual life is to fully see yourself and know yourself as God sees and knows you. Right? You can't do much better than that. God knows you have imperfections. When I look at my own imperfections, that leads to all kinds of bad choices and shame and you know whatever. To see myself as that beloved son, as Jesus heard from the Father from the beginning, now you've got an authentic identity. The identity of the human being you know, doesn't have to be perfection, but it does have to be, or it's called to be, one who fully, absolutely knows that he or she is a beloved son or daughter. So only once those things are properly aligned, you know, is the mission of a well-formed priest, you know, kind of launched out into the world. Um, and you can imagine, right, that doesn't happen automatically. You know, it'd be very rare that you were raised in such a, just a wonderful, wonderful situation that your identity came solely from your relationship with God. And so for all of us, you know, as adults in the spiritual life, what we're doing is helping to correct or shape or, you know, bring more into line how we see ourselves with how God sees us. But you're only going to know that because of your relationship with God, right? I only know how you see me if I bother to get to know you. Now think of how important that is for a parish priest. You know, if one of his primary roles is to help his people grow, in their identity in the eyes of the Lord. Well, if you're going to be able to help accompany someone on that journey, you're going to need to be as close to having that proper identity yourself as you possibly can. And that's a big part of what happens in seminary formation. At least that's you know, what we're aiming for. Um, think of Jesus in the desert, right? So some of that happens through prayer. Some of that happens through the sacrifice of just withdrawing a little bit from the world and engaging in study or whatever it might be, um, but always that goal of learning to grow in relationship with God so that identity becomes more authentic. Then you can go out on the mission. Then when you're studying, you know, well, how do I celebrate Mass? What do I have to do? You're not just seeing it as a function. Right, very self-conscious. Oh, I hope I put my hand in the right place, and you know, all of that is, you know, we all know. You you mess up, you do well, plus or minus. Um, don't ask the seminarians about some of my mass stories. 
uh, I've, I've got some doozies. But in every one of them, right, ideally, there's that sense of as we're doing this, as we're sanctifying, um, it's a way for both the priest to be ever growing deeper in his identity and then helping his people to do that. So what are maybe ways of talking about these identities? And so I put down on your sheet, you know, several that could apply to the diocesan parish priest. It's not an exhaustive list by any means, um, but I would argue every one of these in some way is grounded in scripture and is related to the teaching, sanctifying, governing. Um, but notice on the bottom of the page there, they're nouns, right? They're identity. They're not action verbs. They're not mission. But the mission will flow out of. And for you know, those of you here who are not in religious life, with a little tweaking, quite a bit of this can be translated over you know, to the married life or to the, the single life you know, if you're um, trying to live in the Lord. Because there is a certain universality there. But the one kind of solid foundational identity that I would claim, because it goes right back to the Gospels, it's that identity of beloved son. That the priest is the beloved son of the father. Okay? Now, not all of us grow up feeling like we are the beloved sons of our biological parents. Um, that's just a reality. Uh, or, to whatever degree we do feel like we're the beloved son, there's always going to be, you know, no father, no matter how wonderful he is, is going to fully embody, you know, the love of God the Father. And so, what it means to grow in that identity. And our faculty members here can certainly attest to the fact it can be a powerful, powerful journey for a seminarian to actually grow in that realization. I mean, we can all mouth the words, yes, I am God's beloved son, I am God's beloved daughter. But to really feel that, to really internalize that, to really be able to get up and walk into the situations of real life with the confidence and the inner peace that grows from saying, I am a beloved son. Not just because all creation is beloved of God, but no, I, you know, you are my beloved son. At Jesus' baptism, he doesn't say, all humanity is my beloved children, and you too, Jesus. You know, that just laser beam precision, you are my beloved son. And that ideally, at least, the well-formed parish priest has that realization, right? He's learned about it, certainly through his studies, but he's prayed with it. He's experienced it, right, through encounter. And here's where the action reinforces the identity sometimes. You know, as the seminarian goes out and interacts in the parish, you know, or as the priest goes out, you know, in his parish. As you're serving others, do you really feel you're growing in your identity as being a beloved son yourself? Um, I can say this about myself, you know, well before I was a priest, I only came to more fully realize how much I was my father's son as I started interacting with other people, you know, who didn't care whose father I had. But you start realizing where that identity begins to come into play. Um, and we've all had that experience where someone comes up to you and, you know, not just because of what you look like, but, oh, you know, you're just like your father. Oh, you're just like your mother. Um, and someone's very proud to hear that, and maybe someone's not. But, you know, that's their issue. It's a beautiful thing. Um, well, that's true in our humanity. Now, what would it look like to really have that growing realization um, in our full sense, you know, in our true deepest identity? So that is a primary goal. If a man leaves here without truly feeling, and we all do it imperfectly. So I'm not saying you know, we're ever going to have the fullest realization of Jesus at his baptism. But if a man leaves here and he's really, really doubtful that he is a beloved son of the Father, you know, then he should take some time away. You know, something here hasn't worked. And so a big part of formation is just trying to create the freedom where a man can say to his spiritual director. That's why seminary, you know, it's not a six-month program. Uh, for those of you who have sons or brothers or friends going through pre-theology, well, they're looking at a six-year program. For those who've come to us um, already from college seminary with a philosophy degree, it's a four-year program. I'm the youngest of seven kids. All the others are married. 
And every one of them, to a man and woman, said to me, I wish I had six years of formation before I got married. You know, I wish I had six years to look at myself, to ask these questions, to have all these cruel people looking at me, picking me apart, you know, a rector threatening me within an inch of my life every day. No, but the, the beauty of it, you know, if, and here's the big if, it's a huge condition, if a man is willing to surrender into it. Because you can go under the radar in this program as in any other program, right? Um, you know, nobody hooks you up to a lie detector test. But obviously, you know, nobody starts this journey without having some desire, a vocation, you know, that gets you to the point of starting seminary. You can trust that. Now, if good discernment follows, yeah, your life may lead in another direction, but it's been very beautiful if it was well discerned. And so to enter into that program of formation, a man should have no doubt whatsoever, whether he becomes ultimately an ordained priest or not, that he's a beloved son. You know, if I could wave my magic wand and give a gift to every man, woman, and child in this room, it would be that we would all leave with a profound sense that we are a beloved daughter or a beloved son of God. Um, so that's a big part, and I would say the primary part, of priestly formation, that that identity would at least have a good, solid foundation that will grow for the rest of our lives. Um, a chaste spouse, okay? Sometimes this is a tough one, you know, for guys to, to wrestle with, or, you know, people outside of the church. Um, well, what do you mean, chaste spouse? Because there's a lot of language like that, the bride of Christ, or, you know, sometimes Jesus is depicted in that bridal imagery, lots of times he's projected, projected in the bridegroom imagery. But I like to just take a little step back from that and not get overly hung up on the specific imagery and instead look at the relational role, right? This idea of, and here I'm not married, obviously, so all I can do is rely on the wisdom that's been given to me from talking with lots of married folks in my family and outside of it. But that is one of the most powerful gifts for the married folks in this room that you can give to the formation of any seminarians in your life priest too, for that matter. And I really mean that from the bottom of my heart. What is involved in spousal love, right? Certainly there's sacrifice that's involved. And the sacrifice comes right from the beginning. You know, even when you're wildly happy to engage in that relationship. But there is a sacrifice. There's that sense of saying, I am, you know, collapsing all the possible choices of my life, you know, and it's with you. And the other person saying the same thing. Children come along, lots of sacrifice there. No way of knowing what the future will bring. You know, huge swings in career path, in jobs. You know, you think you know and you hope for the good health of, of you and your spouse and your family. All that could change overnight, right? All of those things that come up within spousal love. And what would ever lead someone to willingly choose a sacrifice only if it's an act of love. We live in a society that says, don't sacrifice. Do everything in your power not to sacrifice. Um, can the priest really see his life in that way, you know, in an embrace of sacrifice as an act of love? Now, let's be, one of my favorite phrases, brutally honest, you see these beautiful grounds. We are not living under a lot of material duress here. We simply aren't. Um, and I'm always trying to call us out on that. You know, if we complain because the salad's a little bit wilted or, you know, it's uh, 71.5 degrees instead of uh, 70, so why are we made to endure this? You know, but it's so easy to forget, right? Um, it's so easy to forget. Nevertheless, but let's get a little bit more serious. You know, the, the sacrifice of saying, I'm going to wade into this or that ministerial situation. You know, this terrifies me. Sometimes it's easy to be with the young adults or the kids, you know, with our peers or with the Sarah or the Knights of Columbus where there's just this incredible welcome. It can be really tough in ministry to go into a situation um, where you're not welcomed. And certainly we know in the church today there's lots of difficult situations you could be going into. But all the different forms that that sacrifice, the surrender of will, in essence, to the bishop, in promises of obedience, right? It is not necessarily always the case that you will be asked to take on an assignment 
for the priests, the seminarians, that perfectly matches your skill set. That simply is a reality, you know. You might have the gifts that make you just perfect for this parish, but for whatever reason, the diocese needs you to go somewhere else. You know, can you embrace that willingly? Even though you know objectively, yeah, that's not the best pairing of your skills. As a seminarian, to sacrifice in and through study, you know, it's not easy to sit down and wrestle with a difficult text and be assessed on how well you've done that. But that's not being done, obviously, as an act of sadism or something. I mean, it's that sense of, as I take on this sacrifice, it's helping to shape and form me. Um, and then when you talk about, obviously, chaste spouse celibacy, you know, here again is how all that fits into it. Um, it isn't simply, okay, you can't get married. It's what is it that you're taking on and what is it that you're embracing. And I like to talk with the seminarians about what I call celibate love. In other words, when you're in love, affectively, you know, that plays a very significant role in your life. It fills you with anticipation. You know, there are things that you can't wait, you know, to do for the beloved. It's wonderful to know that there's somebody else on planet Earth who's thinking about you. You know, can't wait to see you and meet up with you. And, hey, here's what I'm going to do next Thursday because we're going to be together again. And, you know, all those things that we feel when we're in love. Obviously not the same way, but there is a parallel with celibate love. Um, you know, celibate love doesn't mean just say no. It really means, in a lot of wonderful ways, how to enjoy the anticipation of being together. Now it's not with a singular person, obviously, but it's with the people that you serve. It's with the people in your community that you're waiting to be with. You anticipate being with them to celebrate the Mass. You have a creative right, love with and for them. You enjoy seeing the new life come out of that parish because you're with them. So in seminary formation, what I try you know, and hope that the guys will have the experience of you know, and I know this can sound idealistic, but that shouldn't stop us, to really experience what it's like to be part of, you know, creative, helping something creative grow in the people that you're with, to anticipate with joy, you know, this or that exercise of ministry, or being with, you know, a beautiful reading, or learning to get to that point in prayer where, this will sound weird, but don't quote me, I'll deny that I said it, uh, you know, almost like date night with God. You know, you're looking forward to that moment of prayer because you've been really busy and you've been running around, you know, and man, I've got that holy hour coming up. I've got that time in quiet with the Blessed Sacrament. So it's not just, oh yeah, let me just, you know, decompress a little bit, but it really is this spending time with the beloved. Well, that doesn't happen automatically. You know, that's not generally the way we learn how to pray, even if we go through Catholic school. Um, so to learn and grow in that kind of reality. Uh, we'll have a hard stop at 2.30, so see how we get through these. Any identities I don't get to are overrated, and you can forget them. Um, spiritual father, right, is a huge one. Um, spiritual fatherhood, that ability to nurture, to oversee, to help grow, to coach. Yes, I mean, some priests literally are athletic coaches, but you know what I mean. Um, all those things, you know, that help give joy, life, but also give heartbreak to a father. Um, to have to want so much for the people that you, and then this obviously isn't just to children. You can be, and I say this to the guys, you can be, you know, a 26-year-old ordained priest and still be spiritual father to someone who's well older than you are. No, you don't have the life experience of them, so don't act like you do, but you can help make real for them that love of the Father in their lives. But the kinds of joys that the biological Father feels, you know, are not entirely foreign to the spiritual Father. Um, and to help a man grow in that realization, you know, what does that look like? Look at Jesus in the Gospels, how he exercises spiritual fatherhood. Look how he interacts with Peter, some great examples of what that looks like. The teaching that he does, the correction that he gives him. You know, sometimes it's a kick in the butt and sometimes it's a slap on the back. Um, all those are different aspects that are there. And as the seminarian grows in that identity, okay, what's happening there? His identity is being shaped 
out of his relationship with the Father so that when he exercises the authority of his mission, it's not going to be tyrannical. You know, he's not going to be the father who has such a fragile ego that you know, he has to, whatever, uh, you know, he, he couldn't make the Little League team, but he's going to demand that his son you know, plays for the Yankees, or that kind of thing. No, that there's just a, a natural embrace um, of that child, whether that child is a little kid or anyone that he's uh, ministering to. Spiritual physician, right? Healing. Um, the Holy Spirit is the healer, but the spiritual phys physician helps facilitate that. And a big part of that identity is learning to diagnose. I know we probably have some doctors or medical people in the room, but most people don't have, let, let's just stick with physical healing, don't have the language you know, of a trained physician. So you know, they come in and say, this hurts, or I can't do this anymore. Um, they're not going to be able to give a full medical explanation of what they've got. It's very much the same thing in the spiritual life, right? Someone's not necessarily going to come in and say, you know, uh, gee, this relationship with the Lord is kind of struggling in this area, or this, this aspect of my life is affecting my prayer. No, they're going to say, God seems distant. God seems far. My prayer seems dry. Um, so the spiritual physician to be able to listen and then discern, right? It's all about discernment. Helping the people that you minister to, to discern, to sort out. Um, you know, there's the old joke, a uh, guy goes to his doctor and says, doctor, it hurts every time I do this. What can I do? Don't do that, right? Um, and there's a, an equivalent, right, of the priest. It just says, you know, it'll get better. Don't worry about it. But the spiritual physician, and as a seminarian, learning what that looks like. And part of how you learn what it looks like is having it done to you. So engaging in, you know, every two weeks, spiritual direction. You know, having a formation advisor. Yes, that's good for the man himself, but it's also helping to teach him what it means to have dialogue with others, you know, where you begin to recognize, read what's in the mind or heart of the person. Um, and the more that the seminarian, right, sees the Father, sees God, the Holy Spirit, the saints, helping him read himself, the better he's able to exercise that. And finally then, head and shepherd, okay? But notice that's at the end. I can imagine some people putting it at the beginning. No, the shepherd, he's out there, he's leading the flock, he's protecting them from wolves, you know, he, he's the head, he's the one uh, chairing the finance council, you know, all these kinds of things. And instead, to be able to see all of that work, mission, function is only growing out of the shepherd's identity, right, as beloved son. Now I can lead, and sometimes the shepherd leads from behind, Sometimes the shepherd leads, you know, side by side. Yes, sometimes the shepherd's at front. You know, and famously, the image Pope Francis gave us, you know, wherever he's leading from, what should the shepherd smell like? Smell like his sheep, okay? Um, well, you're not going to want to smell like your sheep, you know, if you're a little bit shaky in some of those other identities. You know, you're, you're going to want to decide who and what you smell like. Thank you very much. You know, I don't want my sheep defining that. Um, so if all goes, you know, according to the desire of the Father, those identities over the course of seminary really do begin to take root. It certainly is not a completed, you know, picture after four or six years. We're talking about the work of a lifetime, as I'm sure every, you know, married man or woman here would say. You know, it's growing an identity over the course of a lifetime, um, which is a very beautiful thing. Um, but that's, you know, what we aim for here.